All right, we're going to get started now. All right, so super glad to have you here with us at Latin Things to talk about your experiences at Facebook and your journey and other achievements. So would you like to start with a little personal introduction about yourself, your name, where you're located and all that? Sure. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, it's an honor to be here with you. Uh, my name is Francisco Varela. I am actually lo located in San Francisco, California. Uh, here, uh, city is over there. If you guys want to take a look, it's a beautiful day here, a little hazy. Um, we're all a great one. Um, this is a rarity for me to be home, actually. I travel quite a bit. Um, I was telling Jacob on our prep call that I travel just about 400,000 miles a year. Um, I've been here at Meta Facebook now for seven years. I just completed my seventh year. I think it was last Monday, Mark, seven years. Um, I am responsible for our global team that works on mobile and connectivity partnerships. Um, for those of you who have a mobile phone, I'm not sure if any of you do. Maybe one, two of you do, I hope. <laughs> for those of you who do, you like to use one or more, or more of our services, uh, whether that be Instagram, WhatsApp, Messenger, or Facebook. Um, we're on approximately, we have approximately 3 billion people on our platform every year, just to give you a sense of what that, or every month, just to give you a sense of what that means. Um, there's about three and a half billion people on the planet on the internet right now, and 3 billion of them are on our services. So we're, provide, we're trying to serve a very large community around the world with a large variety of needs. Um, but the core to our mission is helping people connect um, to communicate with the people that they care for and love most, uh, to communicate with the businesses that matter to them. Um, and why my group and my role, uh, I feel, matter, 97% um, of the use and 95% of the revenue of our company comes through mobile devices. So if there's any friction, if anything goes wrong in that ecosystem, um, that uh, impacts a lot of people around the world. And um, uh, my team is here to help create those partnerships that make our apps run better on those devices, um, that we can make them more affordable to people around the world and bring people onto the internet for the first time. Um, for those of you in Latin America, you might have seen a, a, a version of Facebook that's text only, it's called Facebook Flex. Um, so you have the option to, to toggle between a free mode and a paid mode. So and in the paid mode, you get photos and video. In the free mode, you only get text. Um, that's a program that my that my team administers. Uh, we were also work with a variety of uh, players around the world on how to make the internet fundamentally cheaper for people. And this might mean working with uh, with businesses directly. One of those projects that we have in Latin America is in Peru. It's a company called uh, Internet Para Todos. This is a project that we're running to try to make internet access in rural in rural areas much more affordable and available to people. Um, traditionally, people have only been able to get basic data connectivity in those areas. We believe that by forming a new model, which is what we call the shared network model, we'll be able to bring in a, a type of business that encourages people to build networks out in rural areas and that provide a solid, um, uh, a, a solid return on investment and drive investment into rural areas. Um, I'll leave that there as to the introduction. So Jacob, go ahead. No, but yeah, that's amazing to hear. And especially there's so many people on the Facebook app. So it's super important to make it accessible to as many people as possible. And I love how you're also reducing, for example, you reduce the bandwidth with uh, Facebook Flex to allow more people to join. So it's really amazing to see that. And so could you explain a little more about, about internet for everyone, Peru? Could you explain how this started? Was it part of Facebook? Did you start individually? No, no, it's all, it's all a part of Facebook. It's all a part of what we're doing here. And Mark's core belief that connectivity and being able to access the internet should become a fundamental human right as much as healthcare or access to clean water and clean air. Um, the one thing that we have seen is that when you connect people to information, it changes lives. Um, it opens up economic opportunity. Uh, people become more educated. And yeah, we all love to watch you know fun videos. Um, any entertaining, entertaining content, but it also becomes a big means of, of educating people. And it's no, I mean, this is not a stretch of the imagination. We have students in Peru who are, you know, walking four kilometers, five kilometers to school each way. And before it was, it was with the one classroom set up and you've got one teacher there. One teacher can't teach 25 kids everything they need to know. 
by putting a, a you know, some sort of basic uh, device, whether that be a phone or actually more uh, a tablet in front of them with 4G or 5, with 4G connectivity, um, they can learn. They can go anywhere in the world at that point, much like you, I'm sure all of you do in your classrooms now. Um, you see this photo behind me. Uh, I should give it a little bit of context. Um, I'm proud to be speaking to you because my daughter is an IB student, currently a French American here in San Francisco. Uh, she graduates next year. And of course the IB program was, is a pretty rigorous program. My son is heading into the same program next year. He's 13. Um, so I, I know all of you are getting a pretty phenomenal education where you are. Um, there are students that aren't that lucky. Right? And from families that aren't that lucky. And so our, uh, our role, part of our role that we see is bringing that connectivity to everyone who needs it. Um, and as much as I, I feel it and love it and, and are, am proud of the mission that we serve here, um, our founder, Mark Zuckerberg, is very much the same way. Um, Jacob asked me to share a couple of crazy stories. I forgot to tell you about this one, Jacob. When I was, when I was hired... Oh, sorry. I think you're. I think you're muted right now. I think I got muted somehow. Um, I was ten thousand. We were about ten thousand people at the time when I came onto the company about seven years ago. We're about hundred thousand people now. Just to give you a sense of how much we've grown in that time. But I was, you know, we were working on some of this, these early projects, and we'd started some of the thinking around it. And Mark is, like I said, Mark is really interested in this. So he asked me to join a meeting. I didn't know the meeting was going to be at his house. So the next thing I know, I'm trancing across uh, Silicon Valley here, and I'm going to Mark's house for a meeting. I was so nervous. Um, and he's a very normal guy. Uh, we, we're now at the point where we can joke around about things. So it, it's, uh, but it was pretty, pretty shaking at the time. Yeah, that's a, that's a pretty crazy story. And yeah, it's also amazing to see how you're connecting so many to education. I feel like that's, like you said, it's a fundamental thing, especially for the future of all these children. So it's amazing to see that. And how does this work? Do you give laptops with connectivity or do you have satellites or do you have, what is the, how, how do you really give them access to the internet? What are the logistics of it? Yeah, I mean, and, and that's, you nailed the issue, which is the logistics of it are the hardest part. Um, getting equipment out into the middle of nowhere, connecting that equipment, whether that be via satellite connectivity or some sort of Wi-Fi technology, um, that's all That's all quite difficult. Um, and I just feel, and if anything, I feel that, oh, I think we had a classroom go off a of mute. All right, thanks guys. Um, I think up until now, it's, it's, it's actually been part, quite a combination of what we're doing and where my career is, uh, has come from. I don't know if any of you had any background on me, but I originally started as a lawyer a long time ago. I was an international lawyer, primarily in tech. Um, I've been based out of London. I've been based out of Tokyo. Um, and I worked originally for Yahoo early on in my career. I was then switched over to a business side role when we started um, uh, actually uh, the mobile function at YouTube. So long ago in 2007, someone had the idea that they could put video on a mobile phone. Um, I then spent two years telling people why it was going to be the next big thing. Um, that all led, I spent about just under seven years there. And then that led into this role, um, which really is figuring out a lot of those logistics on what will bring people to the internet much more quickly and what is what are what are the barriers to them that can be physical location so you actually don't get a connection where you are and there are plenty of places in latin america that are like this that we need to solve for two can you not afford a device that's three, you know that's at least 3g compatible so you can have a good data connection or three if you can't afford the data plan right, if you can't afford data. So we're working across all of those issues. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, especially because even affording the device, once even if you have it, and then paying for the data plan gets really expensive and really hard. And in many of these areas too, there's not even electricity. So you could bring all the stuff, but then there's not even a way to charge the devices and all that. And here in Paraguay too, especially, we also see some of that stuff here where there's schools without access to technology and all that. And so you're talking about how you've been working here for the past seven years. Congratulations on that. And have you seen a lot of changes with like, now as smartphones have been used more than ever with the pandemic too, there's been so many changes. How has this affected what you've been working on? Has it had to make you change your plan of how you implement this and all that? Yeah, well, I, I won't say so much has changed our plans as it really shocked the, real, shocked the world into the reality of how much connectivity means. 
for people. Um, all of you remember when we went to, I, I'm at home right now, right? So uh, I'm still not working from my office just yet. I go in a couple of days a week, but I'm still spending days at home. Um, that was the big change. And when we all did this and you all had to go to school via Zoom, um, remember the buffering and the dropped calls and how difficult it was. It all seemed to get quickly. It should have seemed to have gotten better much more uh, very quickly. Um, and that's because as an industry, we, the, we the, and I say the we is the big companies, Google, Amazon, Netflix, uh, Telefonica, America Mobile, Claro, the, all of the, our companies were getting together on daily calls to try to fix the issue of too much data through the pipe, uh, through, the connect, through, your, through your mobile connection, through the connection into your home. We were trying to fix that as quickly as possible so that these calls were more stable. And I think we've gotten there. Some of you may know that we changed our name from Facebook to Meta to recognize that we believe that the next generation of this company will be in the metaverse, um, whether that be visual, uh, virtual reality or augmented reality, where you'll see you know, the rest of the world through a different lens, thanks to uh, glasses that look much like these. In that journey, it presents a new, an entirely new challenge for my team. Video is a heavy, is heavy traffic on the network. Virtual reality is five times heavier than mobile wow. traffic. So the next generation for my team, and I've got a whole group dedicated to this now around the world, is how are we going to prepare the networks and how we're going to work with our partners across the world so that when all of you are ready for, for, a long, time, for long periods of time in a virtual experience, it won't buffer. It'll feel as, it'll feel as, you're, as if you're there. Um, I'm not sure how many of you have able to, been able to try out our Oculus headset or something like it, um, but it is immersive at this point. Cool. Um, at, I saw the hands. Thank you. At this point, hmm, give me a sec. Here it comes. Just wanted to grab my headset. <laughs> Just wanted to grab mine. And, and really, we do meetings in these now. Really? We, we regularly do meetings. And as those of you who've ever tried it know, Things heavy. It's heavy. It's big. It sits very forward on the face and the nose. So that's not very comfortable. Um, we need these to be lighter, to be closer to your face, have better optics. And if any of you have created your avatars yet, you know there's no facial expression on your face. The facial expressions are really limited and you have no legs even, right? So I'd say you're at the beginning days and you, as much as my generation saw the introduction of the internet and the change it made, your generation is going to have the responsibility for bringing this new virtual world forward. I'm going to probably be, you know, well off and retired and sitting in a house somewhere in the world. Um, by the time this comes into full fruition, it's going to fall on your generation to define the rules, how it's governed what's permitted in these ecosystems. Um, some of you have probably seen some of the, I'll say bad reports about early experiences in this where, hey, people didn't have the personal space and the personal guards that they needed to have. Um, these are all gonna be fundamental questions that's gonna, that, that you all will need to answer. We'll do a great job in my generation of creating good devices, getting the networks ready, uh, preparing some of the basic platforms that are gonna come our way. Um, but we're gonna count on all of you because by the time that you are all graduating college, this will be ready for prime time. Um, you'll be defining the rules of the road and what, what the world will experience in this, in, in, this new, uh, in, in this new hardware. Yeah, definitely. And then even for projects like the one you're doing in Peru, that would be benefit so much if you could use these VR goggles without a hitch, it would run smoothly and that would um, make them like immerse in an actual school experience. And so you're just talking about them getting to this career. So. For all the students here, how do you recommend or how can they start to get into a career at tech like you did at Facebook? Um, I, you know, I, I think a lot of you are STEM students from what I understand. That's a fantastic path. There's not one way to get into it. And just like any industry, we need everything. So we'll need lawyers. We'll need business people. We'll need engineers, salespeople, marketing people. Uh, let, me think, let me think about all the groups I work with, accountants, um, finance, it's just a matter of, of centering your path in that direction and saying, I want to be part of that industry. Um, I'll give you the same advice I give my kids, which is, you know, look for what's, look what's, what's growing 
um, and wherever it's growing, they're going to need everything. I mean, I could have been a lawyer in the mining industry, but I decided that I really wanted to focus on tech and that, you know, I thought this internet thing was going to be really big. Yeah, definitely. And could you talk more about the team that you run? How many people are in there? Is it mostly online? Or do you guys mean the office? And what have you guys been doing so much? Um, I have a global team primarily located. Uh, our centers are in um, London, Paris. Let me see. Uh, Sao Paulo, Mexico City, um, Singapore, Tokyo, Seoul, Dubai, and Johannesburg and Lagos. So spread across those cities primarily. Um, obviously, we'll be coming back into the office as, as the year goes on, and I'm, I'm excited to see those folks. Um, backgrounds are primary, uh, two big th- business backgrounds, and I have a lot of engineers on my team. Um, as you can imagine, the technical, the technical knowledge helps, but I came from a non-technical background, and I think you can figure out the basics of it along the way. Yeah, definitely. And do you guys have any questions? Is there any questions I want to ask? We could take a break right now and... I think I saw one in the chat. Yeah, let's check it out. Um, I'll read it out here. WhatsApp is the main way most, uh, sorry, here in Argentina, WhatsApp is the main way most people communicate. Does Meta have any policies or considerations for guaranteeing, guaranteeing service or protecting service for large communities that come to rely on these technologies? Um, boy, let me... I think the the biggest I think the biggest threat to our services is actually government policy. Um, we are I mean obviously we're committed to to running our services around the world. Uh, there's no plans at all ever to to give up on on WhatsApp. Um, in fact, we're just expanding on it and we plan to to do more. We have no plans to charge for it. I, I think that uh, some of you may not remember, but in the early days of WhatsApp, they tried charging people a dollar a year. Um, when we acquired WhatsApp, we actually dropped that and made it all free forever. Um, there's no chance to, no plans to change that in any way, shape, or form or to offer our services. If anything, the issue really is government policy that prevent us from offering in certain countries. Um, so I, I don't see this to, as being a danger in Argentina. I certainly hope not. Um, I, I think that, um, you know, while there are, while there are areas we need to improve on within the service and make sure, you know, we're constantly making those changes and updates, um, that's not, that's not, that's, I, I wouldn't consider that a, a, a reasonable worry, uh, for most places other than for policy reasons. Yeah. We saw another, someone raise their hand. I was, Dean, yeah, okay. would you like to unmute and ask a question here? Uh, so I have a question on how would a like marketplace or an economy work instead of the metaverse? Could you repeat that? I'm sorry. Could you hear? Yes. Yes. How would the. I think the economy and market work inside the metaverse. I think it matters what you're talking about. I mean, there's there's a whole world to be discovered. I'm not sure how many of you are already familiar with the concept of NFTs. Um, NFTs are really you know, non-fungible tokens. Uh, it means pe- traditionally it's meant people spending a lot of money for art, video art that they haven't they can experience other places. Um, I think that's a really bad way to, to explain NFT. So just allow me a couple seconds. Let me take you through it and why these things matter so much. Yep, go ahead. Um, if, if I have a dollar in my hand and you have a dollar in your hand and you and I keep switching dollars, well, at the end of the day, it doesn't ra- really matter which one of us is holding the dollar, right? We, we both have a dollar in our hand. So long as you have a dollar and I have a dollar, everything's fair. Um, if you have an iPhone and I have an iPhone and we both go away for two months and I say to you, Hey, you want to trade iPhones? You might think about it a little bit more, right? How's your iPhone been used? What condition is it in? Is the lens, is the lens cracked? Is the screen cracked? Uh, is it bump? Is it a, it's a unique item at that point. And that's the way to think about non-fungible tokens. Fungible means it's tradable. Non-fungible means it's not, tra- it's not unique. Or it is unique. Sorry, that it is unique, and therefore, it's it, it can't be replicated in exactly the same way like that dollar was, right? Where you can just trade it. So a non fungible token means just a unique item that we can specify and designate. And now you're talking about the basis of a metaverse economy um, for goods and services. If I very few people in this world will come up to you and say, hey, I make a, you know, I make a, a million dollars or $10 million a year. 
what they'll do is they'll drive up to your house in their nice Ferrari and get out of their car and they're wearing their Gucci loafers and they're wearing, you know, a very nice Patek Philippe watch. But the truth of the matter is you can fake the watch. You can fake the loafers. You might be even able to fake the car with a kit car. That's not possible in the metaverse. All the great good metaverse platforms, and we'll have one, right? We'll have our Horizon World platform. Google's developing theirs. Apple is supposedly developing theirs. Microsoft will have theirs. Um, and there'll be any number of, of worlds out there. Um, those all will have systems for verifying the purchases that you have so that your Gucci t-shirt will be verified. And your Gucci t-shirt in itself is an NFT. So that's one part of the economy that will exist, which is this verified way of, of having services and items uh, uh, that you'll have across your, your, your NFTs. Um, have any of you created avatars yet? Create your avatar, any, anybody? Uh, okay, gotcha. You know that there's a basic concept of identity. So here's my phone, here's my apps. Don't judge me by them, please. Um, I have an identity for all these apps. It's usually an email and a password. That's my identity. As an avatar, you know it took more time. It takes time to develop your avatar, to make it look the way you want it to look, to dress it the way you want it to dress it. In the metaverse, you'll have multiple avatars. You'll have an avatar that looks just like you, what we call a photogenic avatar. Right now, that avatar takes about 1,000 cameras and 20 minutes to develop in our lab in Pittsburgh. Eventually, you'll just take your phone within the next couple of years, you'll swing it around you a few times, and boy, it'll create your photographic avatar. It'll look just like you. You can then have a more cartoony avatar. I want to be a T-Rex. I want to definitely want to have a T-Rex avatar. I think that should be awesome. But for every one of these avatars, I'll want to have things that I associate that personalize me. Um, I am a massive, massive Los Angeles Chargers fan. So American football, my first love. I, if you don't think that every one of my avatars will have something that I can wear to designate me as a, as a Los Angeles Chargers fan, you're out of your mind. I will spend money on this. I then will want to be able to take this to my different worlds. For those of you who uh, play like my son, uh, uh, oh, oh gosh, I'm, I'm trying to forget the name. Uh, this game where you get skins, you buy skins because he buys a bunch of skins, like 50 cents a pop. Uh, somebody help me with the name of this game. Oh, yeah, is it Fortnite? Fortnite. Thank you. Sorry. I blanked on that one. So for those of you who play Fortnite, you know that you buy your skin in Fortnite and you don't take it anywhere else. It's just good in Fortnite. That's terrible. That's a horrible thing. If you spend money on a LVMH bag, you want to be able to take it across the different worlds. So it's going to be, it's going to be an economy generally like you see here, but there won't be the true physical services unless you're pairing things up. What does Aston Martin have to do? Let's say the car maker Aston Martin, what do they have to do in the metaverse? Like where's their role? Um, but they're thinking about it. And some early ideas coming out of Aston Martin are, listen, what if you buy a car and you know everybody, if you buy an Aston Martin car, and it's a beautiful car, most of the people in the world who you're friends with probably will never see it. They might see a picture of it on Instagram, but they'll never experience it. What if you can all meet in the metaverse and you can tour them around your car and take them around the track in your virtual car. And yeah. you only get that if you buy the Aston Martin. Right. And yeah, there's not even a question right here. Then how do you ensure that the benefits Meta provides these communities don't come with restricted access to knowledge? I'm, I'm sorry, could you repeat that? Yeah. So they said, how do you ensure that the benefits Meta provides with all the services you were talking about, the, uh, these communities don't come with restricted access to knowledge? So how is that not being restricted when that you have to put a price on it or something like that? Um, I'm not exactly sure of the question, but let me, let me go through yeah, the right here. tiers here. One is that we have certainly have content policies on our, on our platforms um, that we use to enforce against hate speech, violent speech. Um, we're getting to the point where our, our um, artificial intelligence systems recognize right about 85% of unauthorized speech on our platform. It's an automatic take it down before it's even posted. The rest of it is um, we've hired about, we're 
We hired about 10,000 people last year and we continue to hire and invest heavily into phys it's just actual people reviewing content that's reported on our systems. So we have our own, so we'll have our own, our own guidelines for what's permitted and what's not. After that, there's governmental guidelines, right? So if you are in, uh, for those of you with, uh, the easiest one to point to, uh, with, you know, who, who are familiar with Europe and content guidelines in Europe, um, in France, you cannot buy a copy of, uh, of Mein Kampf or any uh, Nazi related content. So that's restricted by the government. That's not something that we make. And we certainly need to abide by those governmental guidelines when we're offering the services in that country. Yeah. And here, do you see the question in the chat? Let me check. I've only got those two questions. Yeah. Argentina. Okay, okay. Yeah, the second one. I thought that was, how do you ensure that Metafred's benefits? Okay, sorry, there have been some concerns raised about offering low budget internet access and under gatekeeper forward access. Okay, gotcha. So that's, um, I, I think that's what I just answered. In terms of our services, so to be clear, we offer two services generally with our programs. One is that text only version of Facebook and you can toggle data on or off. Secondly, is we also offer a service um, called Discover also and free basics. What this is, is access to, um, to internet sites across the world on a text only basis. And with Discover, which launched, I believe in Peru most recently, um, you can access anything. So, so long as just text, you know, it, so, so you can always read the text, the pictures and the, and the video don't come through because those are paid services that you need to pay for. Our partners don't give that for free. It's really heavy and, and really expensive to give but we're not trying to be the gatekeeper of, of information, just to be really clear. Yeah, and going back to the metaverse world, will, are you gonna look into partnering with other companies like Google or some and all that, where you can go from one to the other and then be able to exchange, I think you're talking about exchanging goods too, but how will that work with the multiple worlds and all that? Well, that's what we're encouraging. So when I'm, we're at the very beginning of all of this, um, and we believe strongly in what we call identity portability so that you don't have to change who you are, change your avatar when you're moving between our world and Google's and Apple's and Microsoft and who el whoever else's. And if we can all buy into this as an industry, we think that this is one of the core features that will allow the metaverse to really explode. Yeah. And then we have another question saying, are there going to be normal jobs in the meta and what cryptos are there going to be? Normal jobs in, meta, in the metaverse and what cryptos are there going to be? Okay, I, the sec, well, I'll take the second part first because it's, that's the unknown, right? We see, any we see a variety of cryptocurrencies out there and obviously the crypto markets have had quite a, quite a, a tumultuous time over the last weeks. Um, I'll be, I'll be honest. I'm still big on Bitcoin and Ethereum. I think those are pretty, pretty standard. Uh, those are becoming industry standards. Um, I think there's a real role for stable coins. Uh, and the, by what I mean by stable coins are not, are, are truly backed one-to-one -one by, um, uh, by currency. I'll give you an example of one. Um, there's a, a USDC, US digital coin, uh, through a company called Circle, they started it. But for every for every uh, USDC they have, there's a dollar in a bank backing it up. It's a very antiquated system. It's not leveraged. It's not leveraged at all as we normally would, as a normal bank would. But I think it's going to take that type of solidity to to keep uh, to get people more people into crypto. Um, whether regular jobs within the <coughs> excuse me within the metaverse, I think the better the better way of posing it is. Are there jobs that are exclusively uh, exclusively exist because the metaverse was created? I think that's an absolute yes. I also think there are jobs that are going to take place, you know, that, that normally would take place just as we would here, and the metaverse will allow those to happen. For example, um, I miss going into the office and seeing my colleagues. I do believe that many of you will only know your colleagues in a metaverse, where you where you're going to meet to the office every day. In some sort of in some sort of virtual experience, because you'll want to live someplace that's far from an office that actually exists, 
right? You can live in the countryside, you can live out in the, up in the mountain, and you can still go to the office every day without 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 that experience. I also believe that there'll be experiences that that will be enhanced by the metaverse. I think we're already seeing examples within mental health, um, dealing with trauma, where the metaverse actually provides a very unique way of being able to treat people. Yeah, I think it's amazing how you're providing so much accessibility with the metaverse and all that. And we have another question. I think this is a great question. How are you preparing server side for the massive changes that Meta will bring? In other words, how much more is Meta demanding than the 3 billion people in your services already are? So how are you going to adapt to so many more people coming in? Because you said there's 3 billion people on Meta. So how does how are you preparing server side for this huge amount of people? Um, we have some phenomenal people working on this. I, I, I would be out of my depth to be able to answer all the technical questions around this. Um, but we recently announced that our Andrew Bosworth, our head of reality labs, was actually going to become our new CTIO, uh, our new che chief technology officer. Um, he's, his team is tasked, and I work very closely with parts of that team, to make sure that our data center built, that everything we need in our background is, is ready. Um, we will have some time. Like I said, this is not going to be the future in the next year. Uh, I think this is more of a seven to 10 year future for this company, which means that all of you will be sitting right about your mid twenties and ready, uh, and ready to join the fight when this comes around. Yeah, definitely. And then any other questions we can take over now? Just say hello. Uh, if you want. What are some examples of things that need to advance society to move into the virtual age? Yeah. So, Yes, what are some examples of things that need to advance before we can move into a, like a huge shift into the metaverse and relying a lot on it? Yeah, no, thanks. To, uh, the biggest, uh, there's two large barriers. One is the actual physical hardware, right? You've got to, the actual thing that goes on your face has to work. It has to be comfortable. Um, we also need other ways of feedback, right? How, how do you measure, um, how do you feel things? Right? Do you have a risk, some sort of risk input? Um, how do you make input just, just generally easier? So the hardware has to exist. Um, I, should, I said two, I should say three. Two, the platforms themselves have to exist. It's too, it's too hard right now to create worlds in any of these experiences right now. So on our platform, Horizons, it takes too long to create a room, just a basic room. Um, our view is that you should be able to speak to it, and that's where we're kind of uh, focusing our efforts. So you'll be able to enter into an empty space and say, great, I want this to be a conference room. I need a table, 12 chairs. I want the table to be this color, this, and just get it snapped out, right? Or I want a beach. I want a beach. I want it to look like the beach in the Yucatan Peninsula. I want the clear water. I want some palm trees. And while I know it doesn't belong here, I also want an elephant sitting here. Right. Because it has to be, of course, very easy to set this up and very easy to, to incorporate into your life for people to actually start using it more often. Exactly. And, and lastly, obviously, as I mentioned before, the connectivity, making sure that everyone can actually have this experience on, in their homes that, you know, in my family of four, all of us can be in the latest generation of hardware and the, that the latency, that everything seems perfect, really fast. It's not stuttering. Uh, there's no delay. And, and that we're all in the, we can all exist in that experience simultaneously. All right, I think that's it. If there's any final questions, yeah, no. Uh, the one I wrote. I didn't get. It. I didn't get. It. Just say it. Yeah. I didn't get. It. Sorry. Can you just say it alone? Sorry, one second. Yeah, and if there's any questions online, we can take them right now too. Okay, yeah, uh, because I see like snow and it looks like mountains in my picture. Does he like skiing? Someone asked, they saw in the picture there's snow and mountains, and they're curious if you like skiing. Yes, I'm a huge, huge fan of skiing. Uh, that is our that is one of our annual uh, ski trips. Um, so yes, big fan of skiing. <laughs> and I'm a skier, not a snowboarder. Sorry, guys. Yeah, he asked him if he goes to Colorado. Oh yeah, he asked if you go to Colorado. Uh, yes, I'm going to Colorado. He said yes. He's so from that, Colorado, so that he's picture is that picture is in the French Alps, and we have an annual trip there with our family and a group. Great. Yeah. If there's no more questions, I think we're. Oh yeah. Last question. Oh yeah. Someone asked if you met Mark Zuckerberg, but there. If you like, do you want to tell like, the crazy story again to finish it off? Pardon me. 
Would you like to tell the crazy story of when you went to Mark Zuckerberg's house to finish it all up? Oh, well, there's not, I mean, gosh, it just, I was scared to go to his house. It was my first meeting with the man. Um, I'll, let's see. Oh, I'll t- this one's a fun one. Uh, I, we were flying in Mark's jet up to, uh, up to, a, to, up to a meeting. Um, and I'd never realized this was the first time I'd, I'd kind of been on this private, the private plane with him. So of course I'm nervous and I don't want to mess it up. Uh, and I did, and my boss at the time was standing in the aisle. And I didn't realize this, but when flying in a private plane, you don't have to sit down during landing. My boss was standing the whole time. I just thought that was the coolest thing. So cool. Yeah, well, I think that's it. And thank you so much for being here and a lot of things. And I think everyone can take so much knowledge from what you said and be able to apply it on their own project. So it's been great. Thank you, guys. And good luck with your education. I mean, obviously, uh, would love to have you all of you join this industry.